Chrome powered 3D model. Uh, let me just put them side by side, actually. So um, here's our Google Earth model, which is satellites and high altitude planes. And here's our drone model, which is much more accurate, much more detailed, actually shows the true condition today, as opposed to the condition many, many months ago, and can actually be used for inspection because you've got all of these images. And that's the power of drone data, guys. That's what drone data is all about, bringing that 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 level of detail available to your end customer or stakeholder so that they can actually see their particular building, the asset in a certain way that allows them to make data-driven decisions. And enabling those decisions is what, what drone data is. Hi. If you've been in the drone industry for a while, you will already know that it's not really about the drone, it's not about the camera, it's about the data that's delivered. And it's about the data because ultimately there is a customer or a stakeholder who are trying to make a key decision using the data. So being able to deliver that data in the best way possible is the best way to be able to impress your customer or stakeholder and get more jobs or get more projects to work on. So in this particular video, I'm gonna go through how you can use DJI drones and hammer missions to create an end-to-end -end workflow for your roof and facade inspections of any building. I will be going through everything, everything from flight planning to flying the actual mission. And in fact, I'll be having Dan helping me out in this video. So uh, hopefully that's interesting. And we will be going through how do you generate a 3D model and inspection report and put all of it together into a link and deliver to the end customer. Let's have a look. Right, so just to set this up one up, um, the building that you see in front of me on Google Maps is essentially the building that we will be capturing today. The aim is to be able to create a high quality 3D model or a digital twin, as some people call it, of this particular building. And we want to be able to deliver an inspection report on this building so that its condition can be analyzed and assessed for all sorts of decisions by the end customer. Um, one good thing to do when you've got your building is to not only look at it from Google Maps point of view, but also to actually go to Google Earth and look at the building again, because Google Earth can have the 3D model of that building already, albeit a bit un unupdated. And that's the reason why you need drones in the first place to be able to actually capture more detailed data and high quality data. But just to be able to have a look at that building before you create any of your mission plans is a good idea because it gives you context. It gives you context on what does the site actually look like? And and if you don't have a 3D version of the site, um, you can obviously use other methods to be able to figure out whether um, the site is favorable for drone flying or not. Um, and to be able to, so you might be able to look at images of this particular building on Google. Uh, that's another way for you to be able to understand what your flight path and what your data capture will look like. But that's just a quick tip. So moving on, if you wanna capture this building, Let's go to Hammer Missions and start planning a flight. So now we're in Hammer Missions and uh, I'm basically going to go to uh, hub.hammermissions.com. So it's essentially it's the uh, it's the cloud solution that we are on at the moment. And I will move to my mission planning tab because the first thing I want to do in this particular job is I want to create a mission. And a mission is essentially a, a, a way to say I want to create a file that will hold all the flight planning information and all the data capture information. So I basically go into the uh, missions folder and I can set up a new folder. So let's call this one uh, building capture um, Europe. So this is a European building that's going to be captured. And what I will do is I will turn on the layering option for this and I'll explain that in a second. So let's go ahead and capture this particular folder. Once we've got this folder set up, I will start by creating two files in this particular folder. So that should be new file. Uh, I will call this one a roof mission. And I'm going to also create another file, which is the facade mission. And that's because what we're going to do in this particular job is that we're going to actually create the roof and the facade flight plans separate to each other. But because uh, we had set up the layering option over here, um, we will essentially be able to layer on these two so that we can get high overlap between them, which is really important to be able to get high quality data. So. Going back to our mission files, I'm going to go into uh, one of the mission files over here. And what I would normally do is I would actually 
uh, move the map to where the building is. Since my map's already at the right place, I don't need to do that. Um, but typically I would take the coordinates from Google and I would pop them right here. And then I would see my map center on the building. Right, okay. So now we've got the building in front of us. And what we wanna do is we wanna capture the roof off the, off the building and we wanna capture the facades of the building, all four facades of the building. And we wanna make sure that they have high overlap between them and also amongst each other. So essentially high overlap between the images on the roof and high overlap between the roof and the facade. And that's what allows us to create a high quality 3D model. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start planning the roof because it's the roof mission. So first thing I'll do is I'll go into my missions menu. And as you can see, there's lots of different flight plans that are available. And I can choose from many of these different flight plans depending on the job I'm trying to do. So today I'll be looking at the 3D modeling option if I want to learn more about that, I can click on the tooltip to get more information. But basically, I click on the 3D modeling option. At that point, Hammer is going to ask me to draw a polygon covering the 3D modeling area. So in this case, I'm going to draw a polygon over this area. Now, the way you draw the polygon, it's important to make sure that you are giving yourself enough room for error so that even if the building is not exactly where Google Maps says it is, it's more or less in that particular geography or in that particular uh, vicinity. So you want to make sure that when you draw your polygon, you've got some margin for error. So it's covering more than enough of the building. So I'm going to draw that and I'm going to press enter. And then I can make some fine adjustments so I can move the, the vertices of the polygon and make the flight plan a bit more even, which is automatically generated for me. Um, so that seems to be an automatically generated flight plan. And um, now I can go in and set it up. So I click on the gear icon over here. So I've got the gear icon tapped. And now I can change all of the different parameters of this flight. So this particular mission, we're going to be capturing with the Mavic 2 Pro. So I'm going to change the camera to Mavic 2 Pro. Um, and instantly when I do that, you will notice that the GSD of the flight goes uh, from whatever it was, which is essentially 1.63 to uh, 1.14. And that's because the sensor or the camera on the Mavic 2 Pro is different to the Mavic Pro camera and therefore uh, the GSD is different. Um, in this particular mission, we want to aim for a GSD that is close to one centimeter per pixel. Since I'm already close to that, uh, I'm going to stay at this particular camera. Um, GSD is actually a function of your camera and the altitude you're flying at. And GSD is really important because it actually uh, dictates the resolution of your data. So what you'll be able to see in the data at the end really much depends on ground sampling distance. And in a nutshell, it's just the the distance between every two pixels in the output image. So the distance on the ground between every two pixels in the image. And this just helps define the resolution of the data, which you can go and learn more about in our separate video. But let's say we go for one centimeter per pixel GSD, altitudes at 50 meters at the moment. Uh, or if you're watching this in the States, I'm going to flip this to feet so that you can also see what the altitude looks like. So it's 164 feet. Uh, we can change that to 160 feet if you want to be a uh, bit more round with the numbers um, and the ground offset is essentially um, zero feet at the moment. Now ground offset is really important in this particular mission because we will be flying from the ground and capturing data on the roof. So what happens here is that the overlap calculations by default in hammer missions are actually done with respect to the ground, not with respect to the roof. And we want to make sure that our overlap is as expected and therefore what we want to do is we want to add the actual height of the building as the ground offset in this particular mission. So ground offset, whenever you see that, mentally you can just change that to height of the building if you're taking off from the ground, not the roof. Uh, we have a whole video on ground offset that you can go explore, but the idea is we want to ensure we want to input the right value so that we can do the overlap calculations correctly. Now, how do we actually estimate the height of the building? Now, that's a good question, right? So I'm going to go back to the metric system for a second. So let's go back to a metric system. And we've got 49 meters for our altitude. And ground offset is what's going to be the height of the building. Now, how tall is the building? Now, this is exactly where Google Earth can come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip to Google Earth. And I can see the model over here, which is obviously not as detailed, but a fairly good model for this particular building. And what I can do is even though Google does not actually allow me to, to get the height of the building, there's no tools over here that gives me the height of the building. What I can do is actually, I can look at the length of the building. So if I go into my measuring tool over here, um, so if I click a point over here 
and click a point over there. Um, it should be able to give me the length of the building. So that's about 54 meters. Um, I can click done. Um, I can always say set up uh, a measuring tool again. And if I do that, it's again 54 meters just to make sure that you haven't made any errors. So it seems like 54 meters or 50 meters is roughly the length of the building. And since I'm just trying to get an approximate measure over here, um, I would say that this building is almost twice as long as its high. And therefore, I can sort of predetermine that the height of the building might be between 20 to 25 meters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Hammer Hub and I'm going to change that to 20 meters. So 20 meters is going to be my ground offset. Now, what's really important to, to take into account over here is that 20 meters ground offset um, is not something that you will be flying with. You can always change this value on the site, um, but it's just to have an initial value so that you can create your initial flight plan. And you'll notice that if the ground offset was actually, when it was set to zero, the flight plan was a lot more sparse in the sense that it didn't have as many lines. Whereas when I add a ground offset, the number of images increases. And that's expected because at a higher ground offset, you will be flying as if you were closer to the ground. And therefore, you'll be taking a lot more pictures to be able to cover the same surface area. So that's ground offset. And it also changes your batteries and your number of pictures. So it's important to keep that into account. Right. Front overlap and side overlap. So this is going to be a 3D modeling mission and we want to use that 3D model to inform our inspection reports later on. So we want to keep that at least 70%. Um, since this is a fairly small building that we can keep, we can go up to 80% overlap. But if we were covering a really large building, then what you would want to do in that scenario is that you would want to go to 70% because that helps reducing the number of images you need. So if we were capturing a large area, then we'd go for 70%. Since this is a relatively small area, small building, then we would go for 80%. Flight direction. So this is automatically calculated for us by Hammer. So we don't really need to change this. It's essentially along the longest edge of the polygon. It makes the flight path look really neat. So we don't really need to change this. But we do have the setting in case we come up with a very really odd shape or we come up with a scenario where we want the drone to actually follow the the flight path, which is more optimal in terms of wind. So that setting's just always there, but it doesn't need to be. We don't really need to act on that setting for this particular mission. Right um, now, we are going to be looking at gimbal tilt. Gimbal tilt is going to be negative ninety, so that's just basically the camera looking straight down, and that's what we want because this is just the roof that's been captured. Flight speed at the moment is one meter per second. Now. It's one meter per second because it's calculated depending on the number of pictures they're going to be taken and the distance between images. So if I turn on the images, so there's an option here to show planned images. If I turn that on, you'll be able to see all the planned images. All of these blue dots is where it's basically where the drone's going to fly and take an image. And what I can do is I can actually go into my measurement tools over here. So I can use this measurement tool and I can actually check the distance between every two images. So it seems like it's that's about five meters at the moment. So, um, and I can get rid of that. So basically it's gonna be taking images uh, every five meters. And if you look at the the actual um, shutter speed, uh, you will realize for this particular drone, which is roughly, basically the it can take an image every two seconds. Then you will realize that actually what happens is that your flight speed is a function of those two values. So because it's taking a picture every five meters and it can only take one picture every two seconds, you actually can't fly faster than two meters per second. And because we've got a ground offset involved and we've, we want to be conservative, the flight speed that's been calculated by Hammer in this particular case is one meter per second. Now you could change that flight speed, uh, but Hammer will ask you to use optimal flight speed and bring you back to one meter per second. So you don't want to fly faster than your drone can take pictures as the, as the nutshell story over here. So ideally you want to keep that to what Hammer has calculated for you. Um, and then you've got the reverse flight path option. So um, but you can see by default, the start flight option is pointing to this particular end. And so if you were standing anywhere around here, we'll be able to see the drone take off and start the flights over here. However, if we wanted to change the flight path so that it's actually starting over here, because maybe we're taking off from somewhere here and we want to see the drone start over here, then we can do that. And the result in the end is going to be the same you're not going to have much of a difference but the important thing is that you're able to actually change the flight path if required at all 
And lastly, smooth corners is important. Um, best to keep that on. So smooth corners basically adds these turns on every corner, which allows the drones to actually fly really smoothly from point to point. And that really helps because what you want to do is that you don't want to take too much time doing your turns because that eats up too much battery. And in fact, it's not really useful. You want to make sure that you're as efficient as possible in your flights. Okay, and that pretty much covers our roof inspection. So that's the roof mission for our 3D model. And as I mentioned, we're going to be doing this particular mission in two different parts. It's going to be the roof and then the facade, mm -hmm. but that should cover the roof in a nutshell. And if I was to press play, I can very quickly see what the flight will look like. So I can see both in 2D and 3D. There's a little drone simulator that shows up on the screen and this blue triangle that's currently going around the screen and following the flight path is actually the flight path that's going to be flown. I can see this both in 2D and 3D. So I can bring up the 2D flight plan and the 3D flight plan. And if I press play again, I'll be able to see what the drone will do in flight. So it's going to start over there. It's going to come around here. It's going to go down. And it's going to do these up and down legs across the building. And then it's going to always say go left and right. So that's how the flight would work. It's got the all the options that you want to be able to have to be able to simulate your flight so that if there are any errors, you can actually correct for them before you go to the site because we want to minimize the amount of time spent on the site flight planning. We want to actually do most of the capture on site and then spend time doing some of the post-processing, the review and deliver high quality data. So that's pretty much it. Um, one other thing that you can do is that you can also just have a quick look at this particular site and make sure there's no no-fly zones. So if you have an option over here, you can click on this option. That brings you to drone safety map and then drone safety map will be able to show you whether or not you have a no-fly zone in that particular area. So at the moment, in this particular area, there is no no-fly zone, so we should be good. Um, however, there are all of these different ground hazards that need to be counted for. And generally speaking, you want to make sure that your flight is compliant and there is no issues with respect to local authorities. So you can always do that. Um, and at the moment, there's nothing over here that's stopping us from going ahead with our flight. So. We've got our flight simulated. Uh, the next step in this process uh, would be to, to get sign off on this flight plan. So you can share the flight plan. So you can click on the share button and you can share this flight plan with your team members. So you can add their email address over here and then they will get an invite to have a look at the flight as well. Or if you want, you can also create a link and you can send this link to any one of your stakeholders um, any one of your team members, if you want to get any feedback from them on the flight that you've planned. If you want to send that flight to us and have our feedback on it, you're very welcome to do that. Um, so that's the roof. And now we're going to move to the facade. So let me go back to our mission files. And if you recall from earlier in the video, we also had the facade mission that we had set up. So the facade mission, as the name implies, is going to be looking at the facade flight plan. So we're going to go back to a building. And one of the things you'll notice is that actually, even though we captured the roof in a separate file, I can still see the roof flight plan that was created for us. And that's really good because essentially being able to see the roof flight plan whilst I'm doing the facade flight plan just allows me to build context as to where is my other mission and do, do both of my missions overlap. And so we, we call this the mission layers ability in Hammer missions where you're able to actually create many different flight plans, keep them in different files, but still overlay one of them uh, so that we are able to actually build a cohesive flight plan that is a combination of many small flight plans. So you've got the roof and now we will be planning the facade. So to be able to plan the facade, we once again go to our missions menu and then now we can look at the facade inspection option or the facade mapping option. So in this particular case, we're going to go for facade mapping. And facade mapping versus inspection are very similar, with the small difference being that the facade mapping option allows the drone to fly continuously and take images continuously. Whereas in the inspection option, the drone will stop before taking an image. The resulting thing is that with the inspection, you can get really sharp details when it comes to the images. But since our goal over here is to create a 3D model and what we really want to do is optimize the time, we will go for the facade mapping option. So. Let me click on the facade mapping. And once again, Hammer will give us the prompt to draw a line around along the facade structure of the edge and then click OK or press Enter. So we will be doing that. So we've got all four sides of the building to cover and we will be starting off with this side. So uh, I will drop a point on the edge of the building and I will go around and do that 
with every single point. So uh, I'm just going to do that here. And I'm going to do that there. And I'm going to come and drop the final points uh, just in front of the last point. So uh, probably around here. And so that should give us all four sides of the building covered. And then if I press OK, that should give us our flight plan. And as you can see, we've got a facade flight plan and all of these blue triangles represent where the drone will fly and take an image. And these triangles are very much looking at the image at an oblique angle or looking basically straight up. So you're not looking down, but looking in front and that's capturing the facades of the building. So that's really important. Once again, we will be going into our settings menu. So clicking on the gear over here to look at how to best plan this mission. We will change the camera to Mavic 2 Pro because that's the camera we're flying with. And once we've got the mission set up, we will then set up other parameters. So uh, what other parameters do we need to set? We need to set things like whether are we flying width first or height first. So width first is basically the drone will go left and right first as it's going and capturing the facade of the building. And then it's going to go up and down. So um, I'll show you the difference between them in a sec, but let's keep it at width first. And once we do the simulation, you'll be able to see the difference between the two options. Right. And then we've got top altitude and bottom altitude. Now, once again, uh, it's a bit difficult to determine what is the actual height of the building. Um, but in this particular scenario, the top altitude, um, since we are doing our roof inspection at 50 meters, we can keep it at 50 meters for our top altitude. Uh, and then we can see if we need to optimize that further. So top altitude, 50 meters, bottom altitude, let's go five meters um we may not be want we may not want to go that far low because one of the other things that we need to keep keep in mind is that actually we'll be using a small gimbal angle on this particular mission and therefore we might be able to capture the ground of the building without being at five meters so maybe 10 meters will do the trick but let's see that as we go along gimbal tilt so i can change the gimbal tilt and let's say we're going to capture this at a uh, minus 45 degree angle because we want to capture this at an oblique angle. So minus 45 is going to be our gimbal tilts because we're not going to be looking straight down. We're going to be looking slightly at an angle, at an oblique angle into the facade of the building. The horizontal distance at the moment is 10 meters. Since we get a really good GSD of 0.23 centimeters, we can afford to stay 10 meters away. We don't want to get any closer. Or if you're watching this in America, 30 feet away, we don't want to sort of get any closer than that because that's just good for health and safety. So um, we do want to increase the overlap. So that's quite important. Um, and one of the things we will notice is that once we increase the overlap, uh, we might hit into certain hit certain planning limits in terms of how much time can we spend planning. So um, since we're doing the facade, we don't want to get, we don't really need 70% over here because they've already done a double grid on the top with 80%, which is going to capture some of the facades as well. And it's not a really tall building either. So I would go for 50% as the overlap value over here um, and see if we're able to actually plan that mission in the in the amount of time that's available. So, right, okay. So we've been able to do that. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that the number of images has gone up significantly to 300 pictures. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and we've got two meters per second flight speed that's been computed for us by Hammer. Um, that flight speed is actually not too bad since we were getting one meter per second for the roof. Having two meters per second for the facade is actually quite quite okay. And we should be able to complete this mission as um, uh, in the in the amount of time. Um, so um, it says 60 minutes for this mission. It says four batteries, um, but realistically speaking, it's probably three batteries. Um, maybe we need to optimize this a bit further. Maybe we don't need to start flying at 50 meters and maybe we don't need to go all the way back down to five meters so if the building's actually 20 meters um at 10 meters with a negative 45 degree angle we should be able to cover the ground off the building so we can go back to 10 meters that reduces our pictures by by uh, 25 uh, and we can potentially even start the flight um just over the building so we can start the flight at 30 meters as opposed to 50 meters so we are just 10 meters above the building when we're starting the flight, and that reduces our images to 150. So in a nutshell, um, if I wanted to visualize this flight plan by just clicking on the play button, this is what the flight plan would look like. So if I just go back to our 3D planning view, this is what the flight plan at the moment looks like. So it's essentially going around and capturing images. 
Now, one of the things you will notice is that by default, uh, this particular area is quite open. There's nothing taking images of that particular part of the building. So we want to go and fix that. Um, so we'll fix that in a second. Um, but you can see there are like one, two, three, four, five, six rows that will be captured of this particular building. And uh, we can go and optimize that if required. So I'm going to go back to the building again. So we've got the drone going around and taking images as expected. But what we want to do now is we want to fix the issue over here. And since we can still see our gray grid lines from the other mission, we can sort of see that actually this is going to overlap fairly well with the with the grid mission. And keeping that overlap is really, really important. So um, really important to keep that on. Um, going back to our settings. Uh, so we wanted to fix two things. Uh, maybe we don't need six rows of images. So I'm going to potentially reduce that down to 20 meters and see what happens. So basically at the height of the building, um, which has given me far fewer rows uh, and potentially looking at 25 would be a happy middle ground between 20 and 30, where we're slightly above the building, but we're not uh, we're not going all the way up to 30 meters, assuming the height of the building is 30. So some of these factors, some of these variables, some of these parameters and settings will be changed on the site, but you want to make sure you get the initial best guess so that when you get to the site, hopefully all of the things that you've planned are actually as you would expect. And you don't have to make too many alterations on the site, even though that's completely possible. Um, but doing this in the comfort of your office is much better than doing it outside um, where you could have cold, rain, snow, whatever. <laughs> and doing this inside is actually much better. So, um, okay. So we've got now a facade flight plan and that looks quite good. Um, we had this issue to fix on the right-hand side over here. And the way to fix that is basically uh, we will just be moving uh, moving the hammer missions uh, points so that we can allow for um, capturing um, this side of the facade as well. Um, so all you have to do is basically extend that over here and add another point, add another point over there. So we add another point over there. That should allow us to capture more images around here. And what we can do is bring this point back around here so that we're capturing data in this particular way. And now this corner should be covered a lot more when we bring up the flight plan. So if I bring up the flight plan again, we should notice that we've got that corner covered. So yeah, that's all covered now. So that's great. We've got a nice little ring around the building, which is following the structure of the building, which is really important for photogrammetry. So that's all good. Um, and now we've got the drone flying and capturing this building from all sides. Brilliant. OK, so we've reached that point where we've got our flight plans. And what we really want to do now is we want to actually capture the data and bring it back into the office and then create a 3D model from that data. So. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to actually move towards the in-field workflows. So what you would normally do is you would actually sync your mission with the app. So all you'd have to do is click on the share button over here. Um, and then once you've got sign off on this particular flight plan, you can then click on the send to app button. And then if you're flying with a Mavic 2 Pro or any of the Mavics, the, the later Mavics, we've got a smart controller app. So you can essentially download or sync your mission from Hammer Missions straight into the smart controller. And once you've got it on the smart controller, you can fly it directly with the DJI drone. We also have an iOS app, and we also have an Android app on the Google Play Store. But basically, you're able to essentially download one of these flight apps and then actually sync your missions to with the flight app. And then that actually goes out there and flies your, flies your uh, building to be able to create your 3D model. So right, OK. Um, so in this particular section, we're going to transition into the on-site settings and the on-site review. So I'm going to let Dan take on from Hi, here. Hi, it's Dan. Today we are going to capture this agricultural research building. It's quite big, 30 meters on 20. It's about 15 meters tall. So using the Hammer app, we are going to capture the roof and also the facade of the building.
Hello. So that was some really interesting flying by Dan. Uh, and thanks for Dan for capturing the building. So now we're basically going back to our workflow in the office. So we've captured the building, we've captured the roof, we've captured the facade, and all of these images end up on the SD card of the drone. And what we want to do now is we want to actually take all of those images and we want to create a 3D model of the building and also produce an inspection report. So let's see how you would do that. So back to Hammer Hub. And once you're in Hammer Hub, instead of going into the mission planning tab this time, we're actually gonna go into the data analysis tab. So the data analysis tab will basically take you to all of your projects. And what you can do is you can actually start by creating a new data project. So I'll click on the new project button over here, and then I'll give my project a name. Let's call this row building and let's give it a type. So I'm gonna give it building as a type and if I want to associate a particular mission file with this particular building, so if you want to associate some of the flight plans that we created, uh, we can essentially just go in there and actually choose uh, our flight plan, so a roof inspection or facade inspection. It's really good to have the mission file tied to your data project for some of the other features that we'll talk about later. But the idea is that you can tie a mission plan to your particular data projects. We're going to leave the use faster upload option on. And once we've done that, we can then continue and then we can drag all of our images over here. So. What's going to happen at this point is you can actually take your images and drop them in. So let me go find my images and then we can drop them right in. Right. So hopefully you can see some of the images on my screen now. So what I would do is I would just basically select all of these images over here um, and I can drag them uh, to this particular drop, drop down over here. And once I've done that, what you'll notice is that um, Hammer will go through all of those images and it will create thumbnails. So you will sort of see that here's all of the thumbnails for the images we've uh, we've been able to collect. And we can go through them and just make sure that we've got all the images over here. Um, in this particular project, we had roughly 90 images for the roof and about 135 images for the facade. So we've got them over here. And at that point, we can basically click on the continue button and Hammer should start uploading those, those uh, particular projects. So um, we can click on the create button or the create project button and basically the images will start uploading. But to save time in this video, I've already created a project beforehand. So instead of uploading the images right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to that project. So uh, we'll see you in that project. Hello. So we are back to the project and now all of our images has been uploaded. Um, and once we've got all the images uploaded, what we'll notice is three things. So we'll notice on the left over here, a sort of a mini map where you've got all of these yellow dots and these yellow dots will represent where you've taken images for this particular building. And as you can see, we have two different flight plans over here. We've got the roof flight plan that was captured and we've also got the facade flight plan that's captured all of the facades. Um, you will see on the right hand side one of the selected images. So we've got lots of images over here. Um, and so if you click on any one of these images over here, we should be able to actually see that image over here on the right hand side. And if we hover our mouse over it and then essentially scroll, we'll be able to actually see the details of that particular um, building from that particular vantage point in that image uh, to be able to see what the building really looks like. And then we've got all the thumbnails for the different uh, captures for all of the facades and the roof over here. So this is all of our roof images, as you can see. And then we've got all of our facade images over here. So we can at any point uh, flick between any one of these images and see the image over here and also click on any one of these points to be able to see the image over there. Um, now, what we want to do is we want to process all of these images into a 3D model. So that's the next step. And so to be able to do that, we're going to actually click on this process button over here. And if I click on the process button, Hammer Missions will ask me, do I want to process this in 3D, in 2D? or both 2D and 3D. So I'm going to select the 2D and 3D option because in this particular one, we want to be able to deliver a roof inspection with a 3D model and also a 2D map, just in case any measurements need to be taken for the roof. Um, I don't want to use any ground control points because this mission is more of an inspection mission. It doesn't require any form of absolute um, accuracy. So we're not going to go for ground control points. And I will hit the process button. Now, I've already processed this data set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to that particular uh, view where I can show you that what the process data set looks like. Right. OK, so um, we have processed our data and we have our 3D results. So we can see the building on the left hand side. What used to be just a mini map with yellow dots in 2D has now grown up to be a 3D model with yellow dots in 3D representing the building. and 
as you can see, we've got um, yellow dots representing the facade, and then we've also got the yellow dots representing the roof. And uh, in this particular example, you can sort of see that the roof and the facade images aren't sort of connected per se in vertical overlap, which to be honest is not recommended. If possible, you'd want your roof and facade images from the top view, for example, uh, overlap with each other. And uh, they do overlap, but it's just that you want to make sure that the vertical overlap is also there. Uh, but in this particular building, what was decided in the field is better to fly the facades actually closer to the facades. And we keep the roof at 50 meters uh, because that's, that should be able to capture all of the roof. But basically, we've got a 3D model at this point, which if we compare to our Google Earth 3D model is much more detailed. So if we go to our Google Earth 3D model, there's um, barely any detail that we can see because obviously this model has been created using satellites and and 3D um, um, and, and satellites and high altitude planes. Whereas if we go back to our drone powered 3D model, uh, the drone powered 3D model, uh, let me just put them side by side actually. So um, here's our Google Earth model, which is satellites and high altitude planes. And here's our drone model, which is much more accurate, much more detailed, actually shows the true condition today, as opposed to the condition many, many months ago and can actually be used for inspection because you've got all of these images. And that's the power of drone data, guys. That's what drone data is all about, bringing that 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 level of detail available to your end customer or stakeholder so that they can actually see their particular building, the asset in a certain way that allows them to make data-driven decisions. And enabling those decisions is what, what drone data is all about. So, um, what are we going to do now is we're going to actually go through our inspection workflow. So it's all good to pan around and see the model and everything, but ultimately you're delivering an inspection. So we want to make sure that we can actually look at the condition of this particular particular asset. So to be able to do that, um, what you can do is you can actually look at all of the thumbnails. So the thumbnails is basically what defines the, uh, the, 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 the asset. So we can look at uh, any one of these thumbnails. So um, let's say if you wanted to look at the roof, uh, basically we are zoomed in at the roof at the moment and we can go ahead and actually, so let me pick out one of these dots over here, one of these thumbnails. And when I click on one of those thumbnails, what's going to happen is that it's going to bring that image over here on the right. And then on the from the roof point of view, I can actually already see that there is sort of some rust forming this particular uh, part of the building. So I can just label that as rust formation. And maybe that's just a mild issue that happens with wear and tear. So I can actually uh, label that and I can change the bounds of this particular box. Uh, so that's going to be stored now in that image and that's going to be marked up. Um, if I go to the next image over here, um, I can then see what the next image looks like. And um, I can sort of see that uh, perhaps um, there could be some missing brick work over here. So I'm going to label that as missing brick work and that will be then stored in the platform itself um, and we can keep that labeled as well in that particular image um, and we can essentially go ahead and actually look through all of our different images we can just use our arrow keys to go left and right um, so we can go between um, all the different parts of the roof and have a quick look and make sure that we've got everything captured and we can actually scroll ahead and look at uh, all the different parts of the roof. Uh, we can also click on any one of these dots over here to be able to get a vantage point into the roof um, and be able to look at it from other points of view. Uh, sometimes the different angles can also be really helpful in being able to get a different vantage point. Um, so, and if anything pops up uh, as we've done before, we can just go ahead and create an annotation. But let's move on to the facades. So going to our facades, we can actually now go to our facade images, which are over here and we can go through them one by one. So um, we can have a look at the facade images and we can clearly see this building's got some very, very severe issues. So I'm gonna go ahead, go ahead over here and we can sort of say exposed um, brickwork is an issue. And if I want it, I can give it a tag. I can say this is on the facade as opposed to being on the roof. And you'll see the power of tags later on as we were able to actually filter all of the images by tags. Uh, but essentially I'll give that a tag uh, maybe I'll give that another tag. I will sort of say this has got something to do with bricks. So I'm going to add bricks as another option over there. 
if I continue looking at the facade, I can sort of see that there is lots of missing paint, um, lots of discoloration. So uh, I'm going to give it a tag facade and I'm going to give it a tag paint and I'm going to leave missing facade over there. Um, I can see there is more rust issues over here. So uh, I'm going to give that another tag um, facade and uh, rust would be the next tag. So, so all of these are on the facade um, and I can sort of carry on looking at other parts of the building in a similar way. Uh, maybe moving on a little bit so that we're actually looking at the building from a different vantage point um, so that we can look at other issues. So you can also see there's also all sorts of vegetation growth that is going on over here. So that is also not good. So we're going to tag that as vegetation growth. We're going to call that facade as well. And we're going to say vegetation as the next tag. Um, so that should also give us another way to point that out um, and we can basically go ahead and look at other images with the same issue so uh, and what I want to do now is I want to actually go to some of these other images that we've already marked up so for example we've got another image over here and that's again exposed brickwork so what I can do is I can edit that issue so I can sort of say exposed brickwork um, and what I can do is I can add a tag. So I can say this is also on the facade and this has also got to do with bricks. And I can mark this as a severe issue. Seems like this is more of a level three issue, something of high alert nature where which needs to be addressed ASAP. And so we've got uh, a red box around it as opposed to an orange one, which is typically indicative of more of a mild issue as opposed to a severe one. So. Um, and one of the things you'll also notice is that whilst you were going around happily marking issues and, and um, you know, making a point about how uh, degraded this building currently is and what all the work that needs to be done, you'll actually see that what happens is all of these yellow points, they start changing color as well. And that's because the points that have an issue will also change color and allow you to easily then see where the issues are. So for example, over here, we know that there is a, a very high severe issue because I click on that point and I can go to my exposed brickwork. If I click on this point, it seems like there's another issue over here. So I can go over here and I can see that's the rust issue that was forming. And that's basically also visible in the model. Now, the beauty of that is that the model actually gives you context or gives your customer the context as to what the building really looks like. And that's really important because without context, without a 3D representation, just using the images, you're not really going to get a good idea as to what's wrong with the building, say. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to actually click on the, the, to be able to see what part of the, what part of the building the issue is in. So, you know, this is on the right hand side of the building and we can sort of clearly see those issues are forming and have been prevalent for a while. Um, but the image is what gives us the detail. It gives us uh, the actual missing paint issue, or it gives us the actual rust issue, or it gives us the actual exposed brickwork. And it's really important to have the image because if you think about it, your customer, they can't really use the 3D model as a proof in the future to be able to sort of document what was wrong with the building as of 21st of January, 2024. And so the important thing to realize is that the image is still extremely important because A, it gives you the detail and B, it gives your customer or stakeholder the ability to have physical proof as to what was the state of the building and what was done after. So the 3D model is all great, but it, it is at the end of the day, a generative output of the images and it can't really be used in, a, in, the, in the same way as an image can. So 3D model, really good for context, really good for flying around and sort of building context as to sort of where the issues are but you still need those images to be able to allow the end customer to use that data in their own internal workflows. Right, okay, so let's say you've gone through all of the images, you've marked up all of the data, and if you think the data markup is cumbersome, we actually have a new AI capability that's coming out very shortly. We're very excited about it, and the idea is that Hammer Missions AI, which is codenamed Hamlet, Hamlet will be able to, will be your inspection buddy, which will go around with the data set, go around in the data set with you and help you mark up these issues um, or help your customer mark up these issues because obviously it's much better if you have a man machine teaming for this sort of a workflow. Right, and once you've created all your tags, you can then 
filter all of the images that you've tagged. So if you click on this button over here called annotated images, if you click on that, that will bring up all of the images that have been annotated. So everything from the rust formation issue that we marked up or the other missing brickwork issue or the uh, three issues that we marked in this particular image, you can very easily filter and only see those issues and cycle through them. You can also filter by just looking at the images or looking at the cloud of yellow points, which will always show you the images that there are issues in. So that's all great. And that just allows you to be able to build an understanding for what are the issues and where do they exist? And once you've done that, you can now essentially share that data set with your end customer, or you could bring that end customer on the same project to go on this inspection journey with you. And so they can actually look at the property or look at the assets themselves and actually add all of their data. So you click on the share button over here. And once you've done that, you can then click, you can add their email address. So you can add user at email.com. Obviously that's not a real email address, but you would add the email address of your customer or stakeholder uh, or your team member, and you'll be able to bring them onto the project as well. So they're able to actually also annotate with you. But let's say you don't want to do that. Let's say you just want them to view the data. Well, in that case, you can also just create a public or let's say a private link really. And this private link will allow them to access the data. So if I take this private link and if I pop it into the browser, you will notice that I'm able to actually load the same data set um, and this is from their point of view. So this is from the end customer's point of view. They're still able to see the data sets. They can see the name of the project and they can see uh, all of the different yellow dots. They can sort of see the 3D model. You can see um, all of the different things that you were able to see, zoom in, pan around. And they're also actually also see able to see <clears throat> all of the images, click of the images, have pretty much the same experience as you, but they don't need to be logged in and they don't need to have a Hammer Missions account. So they can still view all of the data, do all of the inspections, look at what's wrong, what needs to be fixed without actually having access to the platform in the same way as you. So that's a nutshell way, simple way to be able to deliver your drone data through a link, which is much more digital and much more a 21st century way of actually delivering an inspection. Um, but not everyone has access to these tools when they're on site. So if you also want to generate a report, what you can do is you can go back to your project and you can click a PDF report. So if you click on the report button over here, you can export all of your annotated images and all of your tagged images and also add an introductory paragraph and essentially capture all of those different things into a PDF report. You can add a cover image. Uh, you can also export the image tags and you can choose to add guest links back from the report back to the platform so that anyone who has the PDF report can also go back to the platform and have a look at the data over there. So all of that is possible. Uh, you can also add an introductory paragraph. So you're going to say this building, have a quick go at this. This building clearly needs a lot of work to bring it back up to standard all issues have been clearly documented in this report. Um, and what you can also do is you can add a cover image. So if you want to add a cover image, you can feel free to do that. And also you can add your own custom logo on the report. So those options are available. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go ahead and let this report generate. And once the report is generated, uh, we'll show you what that looks like. Uh, but in the meantime, we, what we will do is we will actually go back to the projects whilst the report is generating and we'll show you some of the tagging and filtering workflows that it talks about earlier. So we'll see those. So we are back and what we are doing is we are letting the report generate. So um, we've got the report generating, which is over here on the separate tab. So we're going to let that run. But we've opened the same project again on a different tab. And what we can do now is I can actually walk you through how to actually filter the data based on the tags that you created. So uh, we know that we had all of these different tags that were created. So what we can do is we can click on the filter by tag option. So if you click on this filter by tag, we're able to actually see whether we want to bring up just the facade issues or do we want to bring up just the rust issues or do we want to bring up just the vegetation issues? So let me just click on facade and apply. And now we can see only the issues that are affecting the facade. And so these are three issues over here one issue over here and another issue over there. And so these are all of the facade issues. 
if you wanted to sort of actually change the tag and we wanted to sort of say facade, show me all the issues that are facades and also the issues that have rust. So I can apply that. And so that's going to bring up just the rust issues. So I'm going to click on that. And these are all of the issues that will have all the images that have at least rust in them. So we can sort of talk about, we can see that there's a rust issue over here and that's why this image was brought up. Um, and so the idea is that you're able to actually filter with all of the different properties. So let's say if you want to see all the bricks issues, uh, I can now see all the brick issues, which is essentially these two images. We've got exposed brickwork here, and we've also got um, exposed brickwork over there. So all in all, the tagging really helps you be, be able to actually get your images filtered quickly and see all of the issues that are relevant to a particular scope. And this is important because the end customer they might want to be able to sort of see what are all the issues on just the roof? What are all the issues on just the facade? What are all the issues that are to do with corrosion or to do with rust or to do with cracks or to do with missing tiles? And you can bring all of that to life by just using all of these tags and make it super simple for the end customers to, be able to find this information. And I think this point is not talked about enough. So I really want to sort of take two minutes and talk about this. I think a lot of people in the drone industry are delivering drone models, which I think is great. But one of the things that is really important to bear in mind is that the end customer is not paying for a 3D model. They're not paying for an inspection report. They're not paying for drone images. And when I say that, a lot of people look at me and go, what, what do you mean by that? Well, the end customer is actually paying to be able to make a decision and identifying what decision they wanna make and what data will help them get to that decision. And in fact, almost short circuiting the path to that decision, whether it's to do with the roof or facade or to do with the windows or to do with the rust or cracks or missing tiles, doesn't matter. The point is they wanna to get to a decision. And if you can be the vehicle that takes them to that decision easily, then that's how they win and that's how you win. And so, I really want to say that it's actually about the decision that they want to make using the data and you want to be the vehicle that takes them there. And therefore, being able to filter this data and being able to get that decision quickly is what the drone inspection is all about. So that's uh, a quick two minute rant on that. And going back to our project, we should now have the report actually generated. So I'm going to switch back tabs and actually download the reports. Um, so I'm going to download the reports and I'm going to bring that up to see what that looks like. So we've got the report downloaded now. And uh, if I bring that up, so this is our inspection report. Uh, it's got the paragraph that we added. We can add our cover image, uh, but the report summary basically has the dates, the total images that were taken, the summary of issues. So we found seven issues in the particular project, six were mild issues, and we had one severe issue. We've got a color code explaining what the different colors mean. And we know that if there is no color, it means the image has no issues. If there is an orange color, which means there is an issue of a mild nature. And if there's a red color, it means that the image is of a severe issue. So, uh, and then we've got all of the reports that, all of the images that come up. So I can magnify this a little bit so you can actually sort of see. Uh, so we've got the image of this particular roof and rust formation was the comment that we left on the platform. And we didn't have any tags of this image. So that's been that uh, has not been exported. And we've also got another image now, and this is also missing brickwork, and that's also reported here. Uh, we've got all of these three things that were on the facade that are also reported. Uh, we had another mild issue of vegetation growth, which has been reported. And then we had a severe issue of this exposed brickwork on the column, which has also been reported. Uh, rust issue again, so that's been reported, and another issue that's been reported. And so you've got now a PDF report going through all of the different images. And let's say someone wanted to actually investigate that severe issue a bit more deeply. What they can do is they can click on this open in 3D view button. If they click on that, that will take them straight back to the platform. And in fact, not just back to the platform, but back to that image and actually show them where that image is. So, um, so here's our 3D model once again, and here's the issue. And what we will notice is that once you've got the project load, loaded up, <clears throat> the issue image is actually going to show up over here on the right. So straight away, we'll be able to see that issue over here. And we'll be able to see all of the different properties of that. And if you wanted, we can also filter for annotated images and look for the red rectangle and see where that lies and see what the issue is. But all in all, uh, we went through quite a few things here. We went through 
how do you actually create um, a roof inspection mission and a facade inspection mission? How do you actually bring all of that to life? And how do you basically, at the end of the day, deliver a high quality 3D inspection where uh, it's allowing the end customer to make better decisions. You're able to actually um, short circuit their path to that decision. Um, you're able to provide data in a format that can be absorbed by any stakeholder customer. And ultimately you're able to do a great job and doing a great job is just what allows you to be able to get more inspections to reinspect that building and repeat the flight plan and do it over and over again and help us build this sort of era of predictive maintenance using drones. Hopefully you liked this video. If you did, please do give us a like um, and do subscribe to our channel. Chances are, if you do subscribe to our channel, you'll see more videos like this and it will also help us motivate us to make more videos. Ultimately, we like when we were able to share some of these things and enable a future of high quality drone data. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.